Hi, this is Pastor Bob Yanyan. Today we're starting a four-part series on Mary and Martha. Today we're going to talk about Mary being a worshiper. You know what led her to be a worshiper? Her love for the Word of God, sitting at the feet of Jesus. Watch with me today as we go to the Word of God and find out the importance of the Word and worship and how it will change your life. For more than 40 years, Bob Yanyan has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Hello and welcome again to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandian. Glad to have you here today. This is the first of a four-part series I'm going to be teaching on Mary and Martha. And I have a a series on Mary and Martha that we're offering for this. And again, it's going to be a great blessing to you. But you know, I pastored for many years and uh, I saw, uh, you know, what Mary and Martha represent is uh, basically two different type of people in the church. There's more than this, but on one side, you have a person who just loves to worship God and they come to church to worship God. Others come because they want to get involved with people. And that that should be a good crossover between people. I mean, there should be a blend of that. But we have those that are just strictly worshipers and those that simply just want to work. And they want the worshipers want to be known as worshipers. And so that's in a way that can be good because it's instructive to other people. But sometimes those that come to, work, uh, to church just to get involved and to work really want to be praised for their work. And that's exactly what we run into with Mary and Martha, is that Mary was a worshiper, loved Jesus. And I mean, that's the example she left. Didn't try to leave this as an example, but Martha did. And Martha was constantly looking for people to validate her and appreciate her for what she did. And, you know, brag about her bread and brag about her cookies or whatever she had to be making for the meal and uh, the the different ones that she had. And of course, this is a wonderful thing to do because some people are just given to hospitality. But we find that really, it was the number one allegiance in each one of their life. That's what we're going to be preaching on and teaching on for the next uh, number of days is the difference between the type of worshiper that Mary was, the type of servant that Martha was. It's great when you have a worshiping servant or a servant that worships God. But again, where you have such a contrast between the two, but probably Mary, we're going to find out uh, both of them had their downfalls, but Mary recovered so quick, Martha did not. So that's kind of previews of coming attractions. And perhaps you can see yourself in this, or perhaps you can see other people in this that will help you to understand. Luke chapter 10 is where we're headed to. We're going to start with verse 38 today. And by the way, uh, for those of you just watching for the first time today, welcome to the broadcast. Glad to have you here today. And uh, glad that you're uh, joining with us. And uh, you're going to like the broadcast. I believe you will. And I'm just different than anybody else there. I mean, everybody's unique in a certain way. But I pastored for many years and brought that into this particular uh, area of ministry here on television. So uh, I teach on many subjects. We teach Old Testament, New Testament, verse by verse in many cases. And I have taught in some cases for eight, nine lessons, just verse by verse through a chapter of the Word of God and really opened it up. And that's what you're going to find out here is we're going to take a look and examine and Mary and Martha, kind of dissect the story and find out really what makes them tick. And so you'll be blessed by it. For those who've been watching for some time, thank you again for rejoining us. And I want to invite you to become a partner with me as those who have just really, their whole heart is into this broadcast. They agree with my heart. That's where it starts out with first. You like the way I teach. You like my approach to it. You like the heart that I minister with and your heart resonates with that. And you'd like to become a partner with me. And I believe there's many out there who know they want to be a partner with me, even feel led to be a partner with me, but just keep putting it off. I'd like for you to become one. And go to my website, bobyandian.com. You'll find a place there to become a partner with me. And again, thank you in advance for doing that. And uh, so again, uh, again, just thanks for joining that great crowd that surrounds me and a great group. I almost like Jesus Disciples. I have a group around me that just consider this the ministry they love to support. And so thank you for that. Uh, Luke chapter 10, let's start with verse 38. We're going to go down through verse 42. It says, as they went on their way, Jesus entered into a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted by much serving. And uh, she went to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you're anxious or worried and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion that will not be taken from her. We find here in this case that again, Mary sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he had to say. And what Jesus is simply saying here is, listen, Martha, what you're doing is important, but not as important as coming to worship me. You know, uh, there's people, you know, when you come to church, the main thing, what are you coming for? You should be coming as a believer to hear the word of God, have it opened up to you. That's the major thing. 
And there may be coffee in the lobby and there may be cookies in the lobby. And, and, you know, more and more of this is being done in churches. And I think it's wonderful. But you know what? Sometimes people stay out there during the the praise and worship. They don't come in for a part. They finally come in maybe during part of the uh, sermon. But they think the main thing is, well, I've come to church for fellowship. No, that's not the main reason you come to church. And you can kind of get the, you know, the whole thing turned upside down and take the serving part and make too much out of it and the word and make too little of it. And and Mary's the one that had everything right. I mean, when Jesus walked in, she knew who he was. She knew that he was the Messiah and she knew that the teaching he was going to offer. So she literally just sat at his feet, showing also her servant's attitude toward Jesus and received the word from him. And so Martha, on the other hand, all she can look around and see is, you know, there's not enough cookies, there's not enough coffee, there's not enough this or that. And she, and so she finally gets upset with her sister for worshiping the Lord and comes to Jesus to complain about someone who had their priorities right. And Jesus was right in telling him to say, Martha, you're worried, you're troubled about these many things, but only one thing is really necessary. And Mary has chosen the good portion. I love this because really what Jesus said is with good portion, here, he's simply saying she has chosen the best dish. What he's simply saying is all the things you're preparing, she comes in and the best dish that's being offered here is to worship me, hear the words that I have to teach because my words are indeed food. They're indeed bread. I am the bread of life. He didn't say this to her now, but later in the book of John, he did talk about the fact that he was the bread of life, the food that we need. And even more than our natural food, we need the word of God even more because the Bible never tells you to fast the word of God, but does tell you to fast the foods and the things of life like that. Because why? You can do a day without food. You can do a day or two, even a weekend without food and and fast during that time, but you can't do without the word of God. How sad it is that we will eat three meals a day and maybe go and, and study the word of God once or twice a week. You've got the whole thing turned upside down because man shall not live by natural food alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So let's talk about Mary, Mark, Martha and Lazarus. Again, all of them were believers. This is the home. All of them were there. And so Mary and Martha were sisters. They had a brother named Lazarus and all were believers. And we don't know how or when they received Jesus as their savior, but Jesus and the disciples stopped by their house quite often. Jesus had places along the road where he could stop and not be mobbed by the people and just be around people that treated him as friends. I can say this about the ministry. And for those of you that are watching that are pastors or ministers, things like that, finding people in the ministry that will just be your friend is difficult to find because there's always people will usually want something out of you or they revere you so much that they can't treat you as just a normal human being. They see you as a minister of God and forget the fact that ministers of God are really placed inside of a person that's just a human being. And I'm just a human being. And so I like to be around people. You know, when my wife and I go out with someone and oftentimes we've even looked for ministers to go out with who understand what we're talking about and will go out and won't talk so much about what's going on in the ministry. That will come up. I had a man tell me one time who was one of my friends, one that my wife and I went out with, he and his wife. And he told me one day, he says, I want to be on the church board. And I said, no, I don't put friends on the church board. He looked at me and said, will you put your enemies? I said, no, I don't put enemies on the church board, but I don't put close friends because when we go out to eat, we go to a movie, we would end up talking about church business. And I don't want to talk about church business outside of the board meetings. And so I put people on the board that I may not actually be that not knowledgeable of as far as is their natural life and everything. I said, but I know one thing, they are highly rated as as this person, you know, as, a, as an accountant, this person is a banker, this person is a businessman. I said, they've got a good track record here at the church. They've always given good. They've always been great. And I don't particularly care to get that close to them. I want to depend on their expertise in the board meeting. And so again, when I was talking to them, that's the thing I do is we like to go out with people that we can just learn to be friends with. And oftentimes finding a friend in a church is difficult for a minister. And so there's sometimes an agenda behind why people say they want to be your friend. I remember someone joining the church one day and as we were filling out the little cards and all that, they were joining the church. I said, well, thank you for joining the church. They said, well, thank you. We can't wait to become your friends. And I, I looked at him, I said, that may or may not happen. 
I said, don't get upset if it doesn't happen. Understand this. The reason you came here was not to be my friend. I said, if it happens, fine. If the chemistry is fine, that's fine. But Jesus with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus found that chemistry. They were a great group of people. He could go to their house, relax, take his shoes off, you know, drink a cup of coffee if he ever did. Oh, surely he drank coffee because coffee's so good. But again, all of them were believers. Jesus and the disciples stopped by their house as often as possible. And this is a special occasion for them because Jesus, Jesus is a celebrity, but somehow the word gets out once in a while and other people start coming over. Jesus doesn't complain, but that's not the main reason he stopped by Mary and Martha and Lazarus. There was time even when Jesus took off and just went off somewhere to relax. And Jesus admonished his disciples to do that. In fact, it's interesting. The first time they went out and they ministered under the power that Jesus gave them, he gave them an anointing to cast out devils and lay hands on the sick and see them recover and take authority over the works of the devil. They came back rejoicing. The first time they said, even the devils are subject uh, subject to us through your name. They were just excited. Look, these demons leave because we have that authority. And Jesus said, don't rejoice because demons are subject to you. Rejoice that your name is written in the book of life. You need to get your priorities straight, as he said to his disciples, and that is keep your eyes on eternal things, not on natural things. Demons are here for a while. Sickness is here as long as you live. Uh, Disease is here as long as you live. And of course, you have authority over that. But the most important thing of why you cast a devil out is to get a person saved. The most important reason why you want a person to get healed is they'll see that as the power to get healed, and they'll understand that you also can give them the power to get saved. And so we have that here in these verses of scripture. And so Jesus, even at that point, the moment they told him these things, Jesus said, now let's take some time off. After one time of sending them out, he says, take some time off. It's important in the ministry that you learn that there's times you need to take off. Jesus could do that with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and probably thought as they were walking by and we're going to get anywhere near where they live that he would have known, I'm going to go there. So this is a special thing in Jesus' life. Let's take a look at verse 39 about Mary. Mary here in this verse of scripture, she's a leading New Testament woman, a great believer who loved the word of God. She had great fellowship with and love for Lazarus. She really loved her brother Lazarus. And of course, we know from this verse of scripture, we know he's gonna be the ones can be raised from the dead. And this is really gonna be a test for Mary's faith and also for Martha's faith when he dies. So she knew the word of God even better than Jesus' disciples. She spends her time, good and bad, at Jesus' feet. In verse 10, she sat at his feet learning. In John chapter 11, the next uh, chapter uh, we'll be taking a look at, she fails at his feet. In John chapter 12, she ends up being back as a worshiper at the feet of Jesus. We're gonna find out what made her great is what makes Christians great, and that is the fact she was quick to recover after she had failed. That's what made David a man after God's own heart. Not because he never sinned or never failed, but he was quick to repent when he did sin and when he did fail. I'll see you right after the break. At some point, every Christian will face opposition and heartache, trials and tribulations, failures and falls. But if we follow after God's word, these things will never produce defeat in a believer. If we follow after the word of God, these things will produce a whole new appreciation for Jesus. Mary and Martha, Faith for the Crisis, is an in-depth study of Mary and Martha. The lessons highlight the importance of the Word of God to our lives and teach us what we must do when faced with the troubles of this life. Message titles include A Great Woman of Faith, Light in the Darkness, When Your Whole World Collapses, I Only Have Eyes for You. To order Faith for the Crisis, visit our website at bobyandian.com. Theology Simplified is a practical guide to foundational biblical truth. Basic doctrines are not difficult, but easy to understand. They often become disguised as complicated or deep sounding words, but the definitions are simple. Using straightforward vocabulary and down to earth examples, Pastor Bob makes complex theological concepts clear and practical. Eight crucial doctrines of the Christian faith are demystified, redemption, justification, sanctification, reconciliation, predestination, election, propitiation, and glorification. These eight precepts, essential for all believers to understand, 
come to light as you read and arrive at a deeper understanding of the finished work of Jesus Christ. This understanding will allow you to walk in more maturity and stability in your Christian life. To order Theology Simplified, visit our website at bobyandian.com. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. All right, let's go back again talking about Mary. We talked about Mary just at the break. And again, she was a leading New Testament woman, a great believer, and she loved the Word of God. The highest priority in her life was the Word of God to sit at Jesus' feet and also to worship Him. There's such a close connection between understanding of the Word of God and then also worship. Oftentimes we separate the two. Well, I'm a worshiper. Well, I'm a word person. You've got to be both because a true worshiper worships Him in spirit and in truth. And truth represents the power of the Word of God. Spirit represents the fact that you're dependent on the Holy Spirit for your worship toward God. She knew the Word of God better than all the disciples rolled into one. I mean, she could have stood up to any of them because her greatest thing was to study the Word of God and then sit at the feet of Jesus and hear from Him. So she spends her time, good or bad, at Jesus' feet. She helped Martha quite often, but she always helped her at the right time and took the Word and worship over service when the choice was there. It's never that she constantly shirked her responsibility to work with Martha and help around the house, but the point of it was, if it came to a time where the worship was there, the word was there, she would put the service off to the side, knowing she could always do that. Like she could prioritize where Martha could not. In verse 40, we read about Martha. She's filled with bitterness. She's got worry in her life. She feels guilty, jealous, and oversensitive of everything that goes on. So she's constantly trying to work herself past that and take the one thing she really enjoys. There's nothing wrong with really enjoying working and, and cooking and baking. I mean, I've gone to meals before where the, the food was just so great. And some woman at the table now, she says, this 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 casserole, this, this green bean casserole, it's great. She said, you wouldn't have to have the recipe for it. And the lady just goes, yes, I do right here. I mean, she was ready because she wanted people to brag about her food and she wanted quickly to give away, you know, her uh, recipes for these particular things. So again, Martha was filled with bitterness. She always worried. She had guilt in her life. She was jealous of other people, especially her sister, uh, Mary. And she was overly sensitive. And that's why in everything she constantly, if she wasn't getting the attention, she was so sensitive about it. And here was Mary getting all the attention. She wasn't the fact, it was the fact that Mary wasn't helping her. It was the fact that Mary was getting the attention. She was empty. She was seeking attention, probably jealous of the relationship that Mary and Lazarus had with Jesus and that Mary and Lazarus had with each other. She felt like she was the ostracized sister. She overcompensates by serving others and putting herself totally into it. And so she lives for the praise and she lives for the admiration. She lives for the things when people say, oh, these cookies are great. She loves those kind of things. And she had a certain standard set for herself. She wants everyone to recognize and admire her hard work and then accuses Jesus of not caring and Mary of not not helping. She makes a martyr of herself. Understand this. Can you imagine accusing Jesus of not caring? The disciples did this at times. When, when the storm rose and Jesus was sleeping, they came to him and shook him and woke him up and said, don't you care that we're perishing? First of all, they weren't, they weren't perishing. He said, let us go to the other side. And they were headed to the other side. He didn't say, let's go halfway in sync. He said, let us, that's all of us, pass over, not go halfway in sync, to the other side. And Jesus so rested on that promise, he went to sleep in the midst of a storm. And the disciples saw the storm and forgot all about the words of Jesus and accused him of not caring. I think that's almost blasphemous to say that Jesus doesn't care, but Jesus didn't come against them for that. He simply stilled the storm and then looked at them and called them little faith. 
faith. And so again, she accuses Jesus of not caring. And also she accuses Mary for not helping. And again, making a martyr out of herself. In verses 41 and verse 42, we have Jesus answer. You know, the Bible tells us a soft answer turns away wrath. And Jesus just looked at her and he said, listen, Martha, only one thing is important. And that is she has picked the better portion. You've got the food on the table. She sees the food of the bread of life here in front of her. And she has chosen the food of the bread of life over that for the moment. She'll get back to helping you sometime. He just said one thing is important. And right now, Martha can't see it. Here's the one important thing in life. The most important thing in life. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. She's so involved in the things she can't see the one thing that is so important. And she cannot hear when she's angry. You can't hear when you're angry. When she was so angry, it's because all the stuff going on, right? She couldn't see it because why? Her eyes are blinded and she wants everyone to see through her eyes. And so Mary chose the good part or the good portion. So every day we have to do the same thing. We daily choose the word of God. We choose worship. Even when other things seem important, the word and worship must be our highest priority. Not the fact it's the only priority. There comes times when it is the highest priority when compared to other things. Every day in life should start out with worship toward God, praise toward God, the word of God, prayer. That's the best way to begin your day. Then throughout the day, be open to the Holy Spirit while you're still doing your job. Yes, you're supposed to do your job. You're supposed to do a really good job at doing your job. But the word and worship should be our highest priority of life, that in everything we do, we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Notice it says seek first. It doesn't say seek only. It says, seek first, have that as your highest priority every day to the fact I can't pray all day long, Jesus, but I'm gonna start out my day with prayer. And at all times, I'm gonna think about the word of God, meditate on the word of God. I can do that throughout the day and even into the nighttime where when I wake up at night, I'm still meditating on the promises of God. But you can't meditate on what you don't study. And you can't study if all these other things are are hindering you and blocking your way. You have to, again, come back to prioritizing the things of life. The event of Jesus coming into the house was for, first of all, Martha, a crisis. Every event is a crisis in Martha's life. This crisis breaks the thin veneer of happiness. It just scratches off that smile that she has on her face, which is just covering up the anger underneath. The crisis breaks her thin veneer of happiness, and so this is what happened with her. She points a finger of blame at Mary, and then she points a finger of blame at Jesus. So what? This crisis again that happened for Martha really was a joy for Mary. The event of Jesus coming to the house was first of all a crisis for Martha, but a joy for Mary. Mary miserably fails at Jesus' second appearance, and that'll happen in the next uh, verses we look at. Mary will be recovered by Jesus' third appearance and Mary becomes a trophy for the use of the word of God. It simply comes back to this. Have you ever failed? We all have. Every one of us have failed at one time or another. But the point of it is we find with Mary, Mary did fail, Martha failed. Mary got back up, Martha did not. Mary's gonna uh, get again, come back to the woman she was and Martha is gonna stay the woman that she is. So we all have failed at one time or another. Life and especially the Christian life is not a coming to a point where we never fail again. Jesus said that should be our goal. These things write we unto you that you sin not. But if you do sin, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. I always tell people this, they say, well, if the goal of the Christian life is to never ever sin, then how am I ever going to get it? Well, that's because you're looking at how far you have to go. Why don't you stop for a moment and look at how far you've come? If your goal is to never sin again, are you closer today than you were 10 years ago? The answer should be yes. Are you closer than you were five years ago? Yes. Does that mean between now and the time you die, you will never sin again? Probably not, but I must sin less and less every day toward that goal of that of the fact that I'm a go my way and sin no more. So it comes back to this again. Did you get knocked down? Yes, here's the point. Did you get back up? These things, right, we undo that you sin not, but if you do sin, we have an advocate to help you stand back up. Mary, the mother of Jesus, failed and got back up. In John chapter two, take a look with me at verses one through five. It says here that this is the first time Jesus did a miracle. He's just entered into his public ministry and he comes to a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And it says in John chapter two, verse one, on the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. 
Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. I want you to understand how she said it. Think about this. For 30 years, Jesus has been in preparation for this ministry. And all this time, she's been made fun of. They talk about her, that she had Jesus out of wedlock. She knows it's not true. But how do you defend that saying, no, an angel came to me and God got me pregnant? No, I mean, how do you think that's going to go over with everybody? She'd have been further ridiculed. So she just kept her mouth shut. And while he was growing up, Jesus didn't seem to come and answer all her questions. He kept on growing the things of God. And now it comes to the point where Jesus is now supporting 12 disciples. How's he going to do this? He does not have a job. He's just traveling around speaking the word of God. He's got these 12 guys that have left lucrative positions as tax collectors and fishermen. And now how's he going to support them? And the moment they ran out of wine, what does she say? She turns to Jesus and says, they have no wine. No, she didn't. She said, they have no wine. It's like, when are you going to do something? 30 years, you've done nothing. And Jesus said to her in verse four, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour is not yet come. And suddenly she snaps back. She understood and remembered what the, what the angel had said to her of why Jesus had come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. She got back into line. Notice again, she failed, but she got back up. Paul failed and got back up. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we're going to take a look at verses 7 through 9. And here it says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. That's what the King James says. This translation says, we have this treasure in jars of clay. The treasure is the new birth. The treasure is the recreated heart. But the earthen vessel is your body. Understand this. Are you perfect on the inside? Yes. Are you the righteousness of God? Yes. On the inside, in my spirit, I am. But I'm still stuck with this body until the day that I die. Three sources of temptation in life is the world, the devil, and your own flesh. And your own flesh can tempt you to sin. But in the meantime, this righteous thing, this Holy Spirit lives inside a temple that's made out of earth and the earth has a curse. This is where my nature of the flesh is. So until that time, am I gonna fail? Yes. But the more I walk in the power of the Spirit, the more I walk in the power of the Word of God, my mind becomes renewed and I can walk in victory every single day. But you know what? There's still gonna come times I'm gonna fall. What should I do? When I sin, I confess it. And then he's faithful and just to forgive me and I get back on track. So notice what it says in verse seven through nine. We have this treasure in jars of clay, earthen vessels. We have this treasure in earthen vessels to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted on every side. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Notice this, are we gonna be knocked down? Yes. Was Paul knocked down? He wrote these verses. Paul got to a place again toward the end of his life where he's looking back on his life and says, you know what? I got better, but you know what? There were still times I was driven to despair, still times I was persecuted, but every time I got back up. The issue is not the fact you got knocked down. The issue is, do you get back up? The answer should be yes, and this is what Mary is going to do. We'll see you tomorrow. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.